everyone. Welcome to this panel. We're going to be talking about uh, the next decade in regulating speech online and what that's going to look like. Uh, we've got an all-star panel of uh, a lot of lawyers and also Jesse. So <laughs> uh, welcome. My name is Emily Birnbaum. Um, I'm a tech policy reporter at The Hill newspaper, um, and I'll be moderating, but I imagine they'll take the lead. Um, so to start off, um, we have Kathy Gellis. Um, she is an attorney who specializes in defending people's rights online and advocating for policy that protects online speech and civil liberties. Um, so she's defended Section 230 protections for internet platforms in court uh, many times before. It's just old hat at this point. Um, so then we have Evelyn Oswad. Um, she's currently the Herman G. Kaiser Chair in International Law and Director of the Center for International Business and Human Rights at the University of Oklahoma College of Law. Protections. Okay, most recently, prior to joining the academic world, Evelyn worked at the U.S. State Department's legal office. Um, she was most recently the Director of the State Department's Human Rights Law Office. Um, Harold Feld is the senior vice president at Digital Rights Group Public Knowledge, and he's the author of The Case for the Digital Platform Act, which is described as a guide on what the government can do to preserve competition and empower individual users in the huge swath of our economy, now referred to as big tech. Um, Feld has been practicing law at the intersection of technology, broadband, and media policy for more than two decades now, so we should probably all listen to him. Um, I Jess think so. <laughs> um, Jesse Blumenthal leads tech policy for Stand Together, uh, known as the Coke Network. He focuses on the cultural impact of technology, digital free speech and free association, and regulatory barriers to innovation. So previously, Jesse was director of client strategy at Engage, a DC-based digital agency. And before that, he was a public affairs manager at the American Enterprise Institute. So welcome. I think this will be a fun panel. Um, <clears throat> so we're here today to talk about the future of speech online and what it's going to take to get this right. So this year, the world was forced to confront some of the toughest issues around online speech, like what do we do when a video of a white extremist killing worshipers at a mosque goes viral online? Um, and <clears throat> what about when our popular posts on Facebook and Twitter spread misinformation about vaccines, um, ultimately contributing to a measles outbreak years after the disease was eradicated. Um, so today we're going to talk about whether there's any place for the government to intervene um, over this next decade and uh, try to identify what frameworks can help us to resolve the tension between, uh, you know, addressing harmful content online and free expression. So I wanted to start off um, by discussing the law that inevitably comes up when you talk about these <laughs> issues. Um, so. Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act is a foundational law that powers the internet as we know it today. Um, there's a lot of disagreement over this, as I'm sure most people in this room know. Um, and so to start off, I wanted to ask all the panelists um, in very brief terms, you know, one to two sentences, how do you explain to people outside of the tech world what 230 is and why it matters. Um, and for Evelyn, who who focuses her focus is international law, you know, what does international law have to say about the role of uh, intermediary liability? Starting with Kathy. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I like to explain what this law means to people who don't live and breathe it quite to the extent that I do. Um, because the, it's in the headline, everybody knows, and right now there's an awful lot of we want to blame everything wrong on the internet on this law because this internet this law has facilitated the internet so therefore transit of property this law must be bad and it doesn't work like that um so in the one or two sentences i try to make sure that it basically means that um uh whoever does something stupid on the internet it's totally responsible for the stupid thing they've done on the internet but not for the tools that they use to do the stupid thing sort of like it's a do you want to be responsible for the stupid thing somebody else did? No, that kind of sounds unfair. That's the principle we've applied here. And then you just sort of have to walk them through the scale issues about why, if it were any other way, we would have big problems. Thanks. Um, yeah, this is an issue the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression has been focusing on for the last few years. And in 2018, he's the top expert within the UN system on free speech. He has endorsed the Manila principles, essentially, on intermediary liability. And he has said those should guide states in uh, any intermediary liability law. And essentially, uh, kind of in three bullet points, they provide that intermediaries uh, should be shielded from liability for th third party content. Uh, content takedowns should be by court order. Uh, 
and any takedowns should follow due process and the principles of necessity and proportionality shouldn't be taking down speech where it's not necessary. Um, so I think it's very important for all countries to keep in mind the international human rights regime, but particularly Western democracies that are the, the champions of the regime. Thank you. Um, well, happily, I'm rarely called upon to explain this because people know better than to expect me to answer in two sentences. But um, <laughs> briefly, and since I come from a telecom background, I say, look, you know how the phone company isn't responsible when you, know, you phone in a bomb threat? Um, we don't tell T-Mobile to monitor all the phone lines in order to keep anybody from threatening anybody else. Section 230 does that for Google and Facebook. Um, and uh, uh, I also usually spend a bunch of my time saying, Section 230 is the biggest single distraction to figuring out what we would actually like to see as the appropriate content uh, uh, moderation uh, policy online because everybody starts with an answer. Let's do something to Section 230 and have no idea what it is they would actually like to do. So the rest of the panel has done a pretty good job, so now I'll repeat it very briefly and then we can move on to something else. Right, so Section 230 articulates a clear and what I would say is conservative principle. Right? It's a principle of individual responsibility. Individuals are responsible for their actions online, not the tools they use. And the reason that liability, that limited uh, grant of uh, uh, shield from liability is important is because the downsides of failing to grant that shield meaningfully harm interstate commerce and uh, meaningfully impose really expensive uh, and potentially ruinous lawsuits, especially on small platforms, right? So the, I'll, I'll maybe end by saying one frustration I have with the Section 230 discussion is oftentimes and almost exclusively these days, we talk about it in terms of the handful of largest companies. And the problem with thinking about 230 that way is that large companies are able to absorb large legal bills. They can push comes to shove, throw lots and lots of engineering hours at complying with a complex system. But you start to think about smaller firms, right? So step down from the largest firms and think about a platform like Medium, which meaningfully facilitates speech for tens of millions of people around the world. And up until recently had one lawyer, um, his name's Alex, right? And Alex had some outside counsel and Alex has since gone on to a new job, so they're looking for a new lawyer, right? And think about the, the liability and the costs for a platform that quite frankly, like doesn't have the world's best business model of dealing with tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in litigation, if they were responsible for the actions of everyone who used their platform. Right, so 230 is really simple. Individuals are largely responsible for their actions online, not the tools they use. Actually, Emily, can I take another swing at this? Because there's one other point that I want to make, and I put it in sometimes in my amicus briefs. And that is that the point of Section 230 is that Congress wanted the most good stuff online and the least bad. And what Section 230 does is create and align the incentives so that the platforms can be partners in optimizing towards both ends. And one of the problems we have now in the regulatory discussion is it seems counterintuitive because we're used to regulation that if we want something, we punish our way into getting that thing that we want. And Section 230 is all about not punishing to get what we want. It's an inverted way of doing a regulation, but it ends up being a lot more effective because it means that the platforms can do the best they can on both fronts. It leaves users in a position to have have market power to choose which platforms they want to use if they don't like the way it's being done. Um, and ultimately, you get the best results. You're trying to optimize for the most good and the least bad, and that there's no other system that however much bad stuff we lament is still there, this is getting the least amount of that bad stuff and the most amount of good stuff possible. And that's why the people who defend this statute so vociferously are reluctant to let go because we see that any other scenario, you would not get these results the same way. So I think, as we can tell, a lot of people on this panel are defenders of 230 or at least don't think that Congress should reform it. 
But we've seen over this past year that lawmakers seem pretty intent on both sides of the aisle of doing something to 230. So while there have been a lot of conversations around terrorism online, extremism, um, child sexual exploitation over the past couple of months, they've increasingly been looking at this law and saying, well, maybe there's a carve out here that we should pursue. Um, and so I, I wanted to open it up to the panel. What is your prediction for what you think is going to happen to 230 over the next couple of years? So I'll, I'll start with the surprise. I'm not saying that our current online content moderation regime is perfect. Um, and I think that uh, there are a bunch of things we can actually start looking at and dividing up. And yeah, you know, it's been uh, a long time uh, since 1996 uh, when we uh, put 230 in place. Uh, it's not a bad idea to look kind of broadly um, at what uh, we want to see. And the question is, for me, is uh, are we going to approach it in a rational way or not? So we can talk about, well, what should the rule be about political speech in elections. You know, we have election law that regulates political advertising in all kinds of, you know, for billboards, for magazines, for television, uh, for uh, uh, where we have, you know, kind of minimal disclosure rules. We have rules about uh, contributions by uh, foreign uh, nationals. Uh, there's nothing that says we couldn't have sensible rules or make a stab at having sensible rules to govern how you want to do political advertising online and not leave it to company by company, platform by platform. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think that the approach of, well, I don't like this awful thing. Let's uh, have a carve out of Section 230 to get to opioids or whatever. Uh, because as we've seen with Faustin, and, and Kathy's in a much, much better position than I am, or, or I would say most other people, um, to talk about what the impacts of Faust have been. But I will just say, look, um, this turns out to be a very foundational law of the current internet. Uh, for better or worse, this is what's kind of created the stability that allow people to create businesses and business models and so forth. And when you start chipping away at that um, without any kind of thought of, you know, what's going to support the rest of the edifice, you run a serious danger that, you know, you're going to have a lot of cracks show up and uh, you're going to have, uh, uh, you know, an increasing likelihood that things are going to break down in a way that you didn't intend. Kathy, would you mind, you know, talking us through? There's an important, you know, FOSTA SESTA case, um, you, you know, that had some big developments this past week. Um, you know, what happened and what is next, and what people should be looking out for um, with regards to the kind of precedent this is going to set around 230 reform. So 230 has done pretty well. It went on the books um, in the mid 90s, and it lasted almost, I guess. 20 years and then um, before it had a change to it. Um, and that change was pretty striking. It was in theory supposed to be narrow. Um, uh, sex trafficking. We're not going to be fans of sex trafficking. That's bad. People should not be exploited. They're getting hurt. This is a problem. Um, but for reasons that were not entirely clear, because it, it wasn't actually necessary to change Section 230 to make sure that the people guilty of the sex trafficking could be guilty of the sex trafficking, but moral panics picked up with some tech clash, picked up with some other agendas, kind of came together in this perfect political storm of let's make a law. And you ended up with a House version and a Senate version that merged together into a Frankenstein monster of very poorly toggled drafting language that imposed much greater liability on platforms um, to it imposed much greater risk of liability on the platforms. And it's hard to even articulate to do what, because the drafting was so poor that ultimately what happened, the, the law went on the books, and as soon as it went on the books, an awful lot of platforms started eliminating an awful lot of speech that technically is protected by the First Amendment. Craigslist very famously took down entire sections of advertisements that could no longer um, therapeutic services. This took down a, a massage therapist who used to make his living through Craigslist ads. Um, he's licensed, et cetera. This was above board, but now he doesn't have access to this avenue that his livelihood was based on. 
Um, and Craigslist had been very candid about everything we read in this law says that we're in trouble because if we let any of this speech go on our platform and any of it happens to be nudge, nudge, you know, therapeutic services, et cetera, and turns out that somebody's getting harmed, the liability to us is just going to be crippling. So we're just gonna, we can't take that risk. We have to turn this off. They were not the only platform that did it. So a number of plaintiffs somewhat that masseuse, um, then a bunch of other platforms, um, the Internet Archive, um, uh, some other foundations that did um, advocacy for sex workers, um, brought a, a, con a lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of uh, what was now known as FOSTA. Um, and it was dismissed for lack of standing, where the district court said, you're fine, I'm reading the statute, I can totally see this doesn't apply to any of you, um, no standing no constitutional challenge, go away. Um, there was an appeal of that, and that appeal was just overturned that result. So the case is now alive. Um, standing was found for at least two of the plaintiffs, and that's enough to continue on to, um, I guess they'll get to the merits, and that's, I guess, the next stage that will happen. Um, so there's a bunch of cautionary tales. In terms of the court challenge, um, it grinds on. Um, it'll go back to the district court, but I don't actually know exactly where it stands. I imagine there'll be some um, conferences to figure out how they're gonna litigate it going forward. Um, it's a cautionary tale for Congress that if you want to mess with this, especially because the impact of speech is so profound, you better get your language right, and you better make sure that is narrow language, narrowly tailored to the, to the problem you're trying to solve. Um, it'll affect your ability to not be challenged, and it'll affect the merits of it, standing and also on the substance. Um, the downside potentially is, you know, the more Section 230 survives, um, the angrier the people who don't like it get, and it just sort of motivates them to take another run at it. Um, so that's a concern. Um, but I think the best we can do is really focus on the underlying issues. You could see what the effect was when you messed with this principal law. Legitimate, lawful speech that was online took a huge hit that our free speech traditions and our First Amendment don't allow. And that's a big deal we have to keep our eye on. So just quickly to you know, basically assign homework for the audience, right? So um, this stuff is complicated. There are a lot of trade-offs. There are a lot of trade-offs over values that are meaningfully important to different people. And lots of people are angry and looking at Section 230 and saying, that seems important. Let's go after that. Uh, and so. I would encourage you all to look at a document that was put out last summer um, by a coalition of 53 academics and 28 civil society groups stand together in Americans for Prosperity included, and quite frankly, a number of other folks who are around this conference today, that went through seven principles for lawmakers who are considering changes to intermediary liability and talked about in some level of detail what the trade-offs would be um, if you actually go in and start changing the law. Right, so it's one thing as a political matter to just say, I'm angry, 2.30, let's go after that. Um, but as Kathy, I think, rightly noted, actually doing that is decidedly difficult. So I would encourage you all, it's only two pages. It's, you know, readable. Um, so I've been trying to survey people within the tech industry over the past couple of months about where they think the most serious 2.30 proposals are um, and where they think we should be looking at. And I think there is a consensus that child sexual exploitation is just so deeply upsetting. And there's there's been this reporting in the New York Times over the past couple of months about you know the images of abused children circulating online. Should Facebook be liable for that? Should uh, YouTube be liable for footage? And um, lawmakers are upset. And so we know that Lindsey Graham, um, who's the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and Senator Blumenthal are working on a serious proposal right now that might, um, you know, make them more responsible for these images. So as they're considering that, I mean, do you see there being a 230 reform there that, you know, doesn't turn out poorly? Is there any way they could structure this that's productive on a, a really horrific topic? Well, I want to start by saying, why are we focusing so much on 230? You know, when in 1994, when the FBI was worried about the capacity of digital uh, um, uh, of uh, 
uh, people to use digital phone networks to go untapped when they commit crimes and terrorism. And we didn't say let's have the telephone companies monitor and be liable for all of the content that goes over a phone network. We passed something called the Communications uh, Assistance to Law Enforcement Act, or CALEA, which said we are going to require that phone companies create the capacity for law enforcement to be able to continue to tap uh, and record and monitor behavior on the phone network subject to judicial review and uh, existing constraints of due process. So what bothers me a lot about this debate about content moderation is, you know, it the entire conversation is how do we make Google the police? How do we make, you know, Facebook the, the content police? Uh, we are not looking at how do we go to the root of the problem? How do we uh, um, actually uh, go after people who are using bot armies to harass? How do we prevent uh, harmful content from circulating online in a reasonable fashion which does not simply say, well, you know what, Facebook, you're a magic box, you take care of it. I mean, I'm dubious. I don't think there's a way you can change Section 230 in a way that is not going to harm speech. In its original drafted form, it already had an exception for intellectual property that if the thing that was wrong with the user-generated content was that it offended an intellectual property right, generally copyright, um, Section 230 was of no use to the platforms. This put them under a completely different system, the DMCA. And you can see, like, you know, when you go to YouTube and it says this content is... Um, you know, it's been taken down due to a copyright complaint and you, the internet becomes Swiss cheese. People um, can leverage these complaints and that when you don't protect the platforms, it causes censorship because it puts the platforms in a position where they have to be much more proactive to presume there is something wrong and take down the content in order to protect themselves. It becomes, it's a way of weaponizing censorship. It's the way that the we've converted the online ecosystem from something that um, isn't available for people to speak freely to each other to something where now it's got gatekeepers and these gatekeepers have their own private interests that may not be consistent with giving the voice to the most people possible. So just for folks who might not work on this day to day, I want to make one thing clear and then talk more broadly about the, the role of the business community here. Right. So uh, federal criminal law does not impact it by Section 230. Right, so all of the horrific things that politicians are complaining about that Emily very articulately listed um, are crimes, right? These are crimes that are covered by federal law. And if DOJ knows who is doing these things, they should go out and prosecute them, right? Um, and US attorneys around the country are empowered to do so, right? So, um, but, but why are we having this conversation, right? Like if child exploitive imagery and terrorism and drug offenses and all of the, the like legitimate horrors that are being brought up and used, why, why are we having this uh, uh, conversation? We're having this conversation because fundamentally um, it is much easier to blame the tool and find the tool than it is to find the individuals responsible for doing harm. Um, and that is difficult, right? Like I'm sympathetic to law enforcement's complaint that it is hard to find uh, wrongdoers around the country. But simply because prosecuting federal crimes um, is difficult doesn't mean that, as Harold said, just sort of deputizing the companies in the middle is the right way to deal with those problems. Right, but, but there is a lot of anger, right? And there's a lot of anger about what should tech companies in general be doing? And while you know we are ardent supporters of the way in which 230 and other uh, laws, both at the federal, federal and state level, um, create a meaningful space for companies to innovate, um, we're certainly not agnostic about the choices that they make in there. And that's why, you know, yesterday the Stand Together uh, rolled out a statement of principles on what we think it means to do the right thing for the tech industry. And there are five principles. I won't go through them all now, but I will focus on the one related to free expression and association, right? Um, and I think these ought to be the types of common sense principles that, that everyone, regardless of your ideological uh, vantage point, ought to be able to agree on, right? So we think free speech is essential for a thriving democracy, 
We think that speech is good and more speech is better. Um, we know that companies can and should set their own rules, but they should be clear and transparent with users about what rules are being set and what ways they're being enforced, because that helps build confidence in a tool that most people, many people use. Um, and then finally, companies ought to resist that sort of laundering of power, right? What you're seeing in so many of these debates is uh, frustrated politicians, instead of asking DOJ, well, why didn't you prosecute that offender? Why didn't you uh, go after uh, that this crime or this action that already is illegal under federal law? They want to launder that power through private companies, right? They want to turn to private companies to do the types of things that either because um, of due process constraints or the First Amendment or uh, just the difficulties of federal law enforcement want them to do. And I think companies ought to stand up to the government and say, no, we aren't gonna be deputized into uh, solving your crimes for you, that just because federal law enforcement is sometimes difficult doesn't mean that we should turn all of these private companies into a police state. Okay, we're agreeing too much, so now I'm gonna start taking the other side a little bit. <laughs> um, We'd like you to get your money's worth. Uh, so one of the things that's important, as I've, I've said here, is I think that we do need to distinguish between Section 230 and its very specific kind of liability that it shields companies from. I mean, it, it is, um, it, you know, it, it's not in many ways not nearly as broad as people think it is, and eliminating it wouldn't let you do nearly as much as people think it would. Uh, for example, if 230 were eliminated, there is nothing whatsoever that would have required anybody to take down any of the Christchurch videos that were referenced. I mean, you know, there's no law right now that prevented cable news operators from running, you know, clips of that uh, video if they wanted to. It wouldn't apply any more to Facebook or other social network either. That's not what the law is, and it's not what, two th and 230 isn't enabling this. So what I'm going to push for here is every time, and uh, I'm, as an author of a book on topic, I'm obligated to plug it and note that it's available on Amazon, um, which is not hypocrisy, it proves my point. Uh, but um, the, yeah, I spend two chapters talking about this stuff for a reason, because it is pretty complicated, but there was a long history with regard to electronic communication. And as electronic communication has evolved and changed, uh, we have changed what our legal regime is with regard to liability based on a number of factors, including the impact that uh, a um, uh, the speech potentially can have, uh, its reach, uh, the ability of consumers to be able to judge directly. Uh, I referenced the phone, and we don't make phone companies liable. Um, at the same time, we also require phone companies to carry all of the speech without discrimination. Uh, so in some ways, it would be unfair to make make them liable for something they don't have a, a choice of doing. And we made that choice as a society. We said one-to-one -one communication. We want to make sure that um, the company doesn't get in the way and create a bottleneck. We want, and you know, we subsequently had laws that say if you're using it to harass, if you're using it to commit fraud, then we will require the phone company to provide the law enforcement with information. But we are not going to have the intermediary make that call. Television broadcasting, cable um, programming, we've said, okay, you guys are in the creative process. You're, you're making your choice. Um, when you, uh, Alex Jones, choose to uh, um, you know, accuse Sandy Hook parents of being crisis actors, you will be responsible for the speech that you put out there because we've decided that it's a very bad thing for you to be able to tell millions of people something that is both false and destructive to their lives. So we make these choices. And the thing that is most troubling right now is we don't want to make these choices. We want to outsource it. Um, you know, we're mad as hell, and we're not going to let you not do something about it. Now, we can say companies that are closest approximately to certain types of speech, maybe they should have the responsibility in the same way we say, yeah, you know, the merchant of a defective product might or might not be liable um, if they're in the best position to judge whether the product is defective rather than the consumer. We, but the point is to actually do this kind of balancing. 
you know, hold companies responsible for the decisions that they do make, like the fact that they choose to weight certain types of engagement um, more than others. Consider whether companies are, in fact, complying with things like non-discrimination, you know, fair housing law when they do particular types of activities that would prevent, um, you know, people of color from seeing particular housing ads. These are all things that are important um, that have nothing whatsoever to do with 230, but have everything to do with society making intelligent having debates and ultimately making decisions about what sort of conduct we want to allow or not allow. Um, so I wanted to bring Evelyn into the conversation because she's got a, a really interesting um, background in international human rights law. Um, so uh, another really important moment in online speech this year uh, was the Christchurch call in which, you know, dozens of countries came together for this voluntary pledge. Essentially, um, you know, it, it brought together the tech industry and experts and academics, you know, and, and, and everybody agreed there is an issue with terrorism and extremism online and we're all going to do something about it and it's uh, you know gets more specific the US declined to sign on to this pledge um, and so first I wanted to ask Evelyn to walk us through a little bit you know why the you, the Trump administration made that decision and um, some of the concerns that you had around it because I think they're pretty interesting so um, sure uh, so I used to work in the human rights law office at the State Department which would typically have looked at uh, these types of non-binding political pledges and the, the reason the Trump administration gave was First Amendment reasons. So I got a lot of questions of, well, what does it have to do with a political pledge? And essentially, from my practice nine years there, um, the US government's approach is that it will not sign up even to a non-binding political pledge if that pledge requires things that are counter to the First Amendment for two reasons. First, it would be hypocritical, right? It would be signing up to say it's going to do things that it's not going to do because it would be unconstitutional. And secondly, as a matter of its foreign policy, the US government promotes the broadest protections for speech abroad consistent with the First Amendment. So to sign up to a document that isn't consistent with the First Amendment undermines all that bilateral diplomacy and multilateral diplomacy that's going on. So if I had seen that document myself, I don't work there anymore, but I would have had some First Amendment heartburn because it never defined terrorist content. And to pledge to get rid of content that's undefined, just, you know, everyone knows is a First Amendment problem. It also had uh, governments pledging to work with companies to engage in prior restraints of the illicit speech. That's also a First Amendment problem. So there were a lot of core issues that, to me, resonated that if I were still in that office, my advice would have been, hey, this poses our typical problems. We can't sign up to this. But what I thought was interesting was our press focused on the US government not joining this pledge, but kind of gave a pass to all the governments that did because the pledge itself poses some serious international human rights law uh, problems. Um, again, the UN Human Rights Machinery, the Human Rights Committee that is charged with monitoring the chief free speech uh, treaty on this topic, and the UN Special Rapporteur, the top expert, have all um, you know, condemned and expressed concerns about initiatives that seek to ban the glorification of terrorism, right? These broad bans on terror content, that's not okay. Under international human rights law, they have to be well-defined, and they must be necessary. They must be the least intrusive means under international human rights standards. Um, so again, they contain this upload filtering, which catches a lot of speech that is probably legal as well, and that was a problem. And the third thing I, I was kind of disappointed the press didn't focus on more is how NGOs, civil society, was pretty much excluded until the last minute, and they wrote a, a very uh, strong statement about that and about their human rights concerns with it. Um, and, and this is something that happens, right? In the face of enormous tragedies, there's often an overreaction, overregulation that can get into civil liberties and international human rights issues. And I would have liked to see a little bit more of a, a balanced reporting on that. I think one of the things that um, there's this discussion, this type of discussion, has a couple of facets to it. One is a practical facet of. Um, we like speech, so what's the best way to achieve it? The most good stuff, the least bad stuff, and what is the regulatory structure we need in order, and frameworks to use in order to make sure we get the most of that? The second bit is there's a facet of a theoretical facet. 
we're proceeding with the assumption that we and everybody in this room and everybody who's listening to us is totally a fan of free speech and that we want free and uttered unfettered speech on the internet and that this is a good that we should be shooting for and we just need to figure out the practical realities of how we achieve it. And what some of these international and the tragedies point out and various other upsetting things in society is that not everybody, including not everybody in this country even, is necessarily on board with that. That it's scary. This is the first time in history that 7 billion people can all talk to each other. And we're not necessarily doing a very good job at it. We've never had this power, this ability, this freedom, and we're using this ability in some ill-advised ways, let's say. And so there's a lot of bad externalities, and it's a totally reasonable response to be appalled by the re these some of the terrible ways people are using their speech rights and maybe say maybe we shouldn't have that anymore. The problem ultimately becomes is there's no framework to be able to pick out those bad ones without picking away at the good things that happen. And from a regulatory and policy perspective, it's very easy to forget all of the good things and all of the richness that the internet gives us and that the speech that the technology enables all this expression to enable and all this interconnection between the 7 billion people. Um, so when we hold on fast to our, our regulatory structure, we are taking this assumption of let's have all this free and unfettered speech and that's a good thing. But some of these policy collisions are from that disagreement that it's an assumption that's not completely shared. So, so some people say, you know, the problem really is these platforms are so huge. Facebook is so huge, YouTube is so big, Twitter is smaller but still so powerful. And so the problem isn't exactly their specific content moderation policies, it's just the fact that they will never be able to fully police or, you know, hold users accountable when it's so large, you know, when there's such a broad scale. Um, so, you know, what do you make of that? Is the issue they're just too big, we can't moderate them. So I want to ask Harold first and then probably Jesse. Well, there is something to that. There's also lots of good things and bad things that come from that. I mean, a global communication network is a very positive thing. The telephone uh, network are satellite uh, um, cable networks that are available in, you know, CNN available in 100 countries or whatever it is. Um, all of these things have their, you know, uh, benefits and their drawbacks. It is certainly the case that we're never going to be able to do the kind of precise pinpoint content moderation at scale um, that a lot of people think we ought to do or that we magically can do. I often say the problem with tech policy is it looks like a magic black box, which means either, one, you shouldn't have any rules whatsoever, you're, you'll anger the gods in the little black box and they won't give you the good stuff anymore, or, hey, it's a magic box, you can just tell it to do whatever you want and it can do whatever you want and the only reason why it's not is because you're bad and greedy and if you just nerded harder you'd be able to do it. Um, we need to think about what then are the appropriate things that we want to get these, you know, say, okay, platform, you can't moderate at scale. Um, and in fact, that may not be the problem if you're worried about all kinds of people getting together in uh, and psyching themselves up to do horrible mass shootings. You know, you don't need something like Facebook, you know, something like Gab will do it for you. Um, but uh, so does that mean there should be no corner of the internet that we don't allow people to get together and say things that you know you or I might think are disgusting? That's very problematic. Um, but uh, um, what I would like to see is some actual serious thought about things like what WhatsApp did, which say we're going to put in a limit on forwarding. So we will limit forwarding um, material on WhatsApp five times and then you'd have to start up the process and the notion is you introduce some friction um, that slows this down so that you're less like a global television broadcast and more like 
telephone networks where it takes time and where other versions of the story can get out. And there may be something that we can do there where we say, OK, look, Facebook is not going to be able to block everything instantaneously. Um, and we ought to recognize we're imposing a terrible human cost on uh, the people who are charged with trying to do that content moderation. Um, so let's think of something else that would be helpful, uh, even if it's not perfect. Um, so you remember a couple of years ago when Time Magazine was looking for more attention and so they named, they put like a glossy thing on the cover and named each one of you Time's Person of the Year. Um, that's a little bit what this debate is like, um, right? In many ways, uh, each of these social media companies, right, connects people, right? And human communication has never been so rich, so vibrant, and so interconnected in all of human history, right? And it turns out some of us are really terrible, and humans do really, really terrible things to each other. Um, it is also true that that happened before the internet. Right, so we can have practical conversations, and I'm sure on the margins, Harold and I are going to disagree about certain interventions and which things we want to prioritize and which things we don't. I think that we lose track of the forest for the trees, right? It is not an accident that the US is home to the overwhelming majority of global tech companies. Right, so Adam Thier, who's sitting down at the end, has written eloquently about this. Um, if you look at the top uh, tech companies, you can look at this in a variety of ways, like venture investment or who has the most successful firms. But no matter how you cut the data, right, the US has 14 of the top 20 uh, tech companies right now. It's 13 of the top, uh, or 18 of the top 30. And no other country except China, which has a handful of large quasi state backed or directly state backed firms, no no other country has more than one on that list. You don't get that level of disparity um, by accident. You get it when you have a combination of three things. You get it when you have a, a strong culture that's meaningfully welcoming of innovation. You get it when you have strong protections for free expression. And you get it when you take a light touch and humble regulatory approach. Right? Those are the ingredients that occurred in the United States. And it's to the Clinton administration's credit that the Clinton administration Commerce Department intentionally to chose to let the private sector lead online. It is to all of our credit and benefit that the US is, has by far the strongest legal regime that protects free expression around the world. And that folks in the State Department, like Evelyn and her colleagues uh, and successors, are willing to go out into the world and advocate for that. Um, but the culture piece is up to us. Right, like you can have the best laws on the books as much as you want, but if you look around at the future of technology and all you see is a robot coming to take your jobs or kill you or some dystopian future, like if we as a society become deeply pessimistic about what is possible in this country, uh, as opposed to looking at the meaningful, life-saving, life-altering, revolutionary technologies that are uniquely American and invented here disproportionately, if we lose uh, if we lose um, that that cultural reverence, um, then you know the the rest of the policy stuff like almost becomes moot. Sorry, that was supposed to be a happy answer. <laughs> no, I, I I think that's great because I think it points out something that like we're, Jesse and I are saying the same things, seven billion people being able to talk to each other. Well, we're clearly having some growing pains because not everyone is very good at it. Um, but regulation isn't the only tool in our tool belt. We don't know as human beings what this is like. We're figuring it out. This is exciting, actually. This is like, let's roll out the sociology and let's figure out what's going on and learn about ourselves and learn about what it means. And let's look at the things that are working. Let's look at the relationships that are getting fostered. Let's look at the senses of communities that are getting fostered. And then let's make sure that whatever regulation we backfill with is designed to create more of that good stuff. That's the things we should be optimizing for. Um, I, I think I, what Jesse said, the forest for the trees, we're getting stuck on the bits that are hard um, and missing the stuff that we actually got right and is worth celebrating and preserving by all means. All right, I just do want to say um, 
but history can teach us a lot. Um, I'd like to point out that Walt Whitman wrote a poem called The Network, which you can all look up on your little devices, um, in which uh, it's a pay-in to the fact that for the first time, all places in the globe could talk to each other through this wonderful invention called the telegraph. And then four years later, Western Union fixed the uh, election of 1876, choosing uh, um, you know, uh, Tilden over Hayes because control of the information network uh, gave them an enormous amount of gatekeeper power. Um, so uh, it's true, we've never had anything like this before. Um, we have had, however, a number of important experiences, some very positive, some very negative. Um, you know, there's a reason why we like having uh, an open uh, phone network. There's a reason why we believe in freedom of the press uh, and uh, how um, from, uh, you know, the uh, tweets at uh, Ferguson to um, the uh, network coverage of uh, uh, the Birmingham March, this has been critically important to be able to speak truth to power. Um, at the same time, we've also, uh, uh, I point out, yeah, face, the you know, Myanmar military was able to hack Facebook to uh, engage in ethnic cleansing of the Rohingya, um, and the Germans were able to use the telephone network and the radio network to uh, uh, create Kristallnacht, and in Rwanda they uh, created an ethnic genocide through the use of radio. Uh, there are a lot of lessons, both good and bad, we can learn from the history of electronic communication, um, and uh, I agree that there's a lot to be celebrating, but at the same time, uh, I also just want to push back a little bit on the idea that the experience that we're having now is so novel that the past has nothing to teach us. All right, so I've been told we're too uh, agreeable, so let me do my best to disagree, <laughs> right? Um, I think Harold's drawing the, long, the wrong lessons from many of those historical examples, right? So the, I, I think what he articulated quite eloquently is in many ways a nostalgia for gatekeepers, right? And uh, I think what he would tend to defend would be a much stronger role for the government or other gatekeepers to serve as intermediaries. I think it's deeply dangerous and worrisome for us to want to go back to a world of gatekeepers. Like setting aside whether or not it's possible, the the um, meaningful diffusion of power, of freedom, to people from a handful of controlled elites has been one of the greatest advances in human freedom in the modern era, right? So David French had a terrific column in, I'm gonna keep mentioning Time Magazine for some reason, Time Magazine last week that is well worth reading, where he points out that Josh Hawley, the senator on the right, and Bernie Sanders, the presidential candidate on the left, and Sasha Baron Cohen are all angry about Section 230 and would very much like for it to go away. And do you know what all three of those folks have in common? All three of those people will be well able to communicate with mass audiences in a world without large user-generated content, right? No one is coming after their microphones. But what is, I think, deeply worrying about this sort of nostalgia for newspapers, particularly for folks who grew up outside of big cities, right, where you might have had a paper that serviced the town, and one or a couple of radio or TV signals that were available, is that uh, you are effectively asking them to go back to a world where three or four people could decide what they knew about the world around them. And I think that's just deeply illiberal, and we ought to all celebrate the diffusion of knowledge. Well, anyone who's known my work for the last 20 years will be very shocked to see me defending gatekeepers. Um, in fact, my point is, is not to return to a world of gatekeepers, just the opposite. I believe very strongly that we should not uh, be a world of gatekeepers. And in fact, I find the situation of a handful of corporate gatekeepers that can be leaned on um, to, as you said, you know, wash that uh, power um, to um, you know uh, pretend that it's not government power when it is government power is extraordinarily troubling. Uh, what I am saying is that there are consequences and we need to find an appropriate balance. Uh, I have an article called The FCC and Radio Censorship from 1939. You could cross out FCC and radio and write in Facebook and internet, and it would be the exact same conversation. My point was simply that at various times for different media, we've struck the balance very differently. Uh, 
Um, sometimes that's been uh, extraordinarily successful. Sometimes it's been uh, uh, catastrophic. Uh, a lot of times when we've created gatekeepers, we have pushed out marginal communities. Um, we have uh, favored uh, the safest, uh, whitest perspectives. Um, the, uh, so in fact that we have an opportunity for things like black Twitter um, or fill in your blank Twitter is fantastic. Um, and something that we should be very careful about protecting when we talk about content moderation. Um, but that doesn't mean that there are no lessons, as I say, like the way in which we handled wire fraud, we criminalized actual wire fraud. Um, how did we handle harassment on uh, the telephone network? We instituted privacy rules that made it much harder for the telephone network to give out your personal information. Um, we have other things that we can be doing, which include a role for rulemaking government policy that are not solely focused on this 230 question. And that is really uh, um, the point I'm trying to make and, and would really like to see, you know, let's figure out what policy we want to do and then we'll come back and amend it and say, regardless of section 230, this, rather than what we did with FOSTA-SESTA, which is to fool around with something that is critical to the you know, current structure of the internet without really thinking about what the hell yanking out this particular piece was going to do to everything else. So a quick rejoinder, then I promise to stop hijacking the panel and give it back to Emily. Um, Don't let the two of us talk yeah. for another 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, right, so I, I appreciate uh, the overlap on 230, but I still think um, the solutions you're looking to, which are largely government driven, risk imposing meaningful speech codes, right? So when you talk about imposing from the top a common carrier obligations on social media companies, or when you say it's equivalent to take, a, a take the models of FCC censorship and apply it to private companies like Facebook. My point is to say that there is more meaningful communications and competitions in the means of communications that exist right now that negates the reason that you would turn to and justify intrusive government intervention that sets the rules for speech on those platforms. So I'm gonna jump in a second. Um, so I worry less about the future of 7 billion people talking to each other sometimes badly than I do a future where 7 billion people can't potentially talk to each other because the gatekeepers are back. I think one of the things that ends up distorting the policy discussion is that we do have such large players and it tends to we look at the questions of online speech and platform regulation like why are we even having a a panel about social media. Like, what the hell is this? It's just the web, it's internet speech. It's just we kind of came to understand this set of services in this very 21st century way that easily could be, was moot 10, 15 years ago and could easily be moot in five, 10, 15 years from now again. I think what we, one of the things we need to do is step back and look more broadly. And one of the things to look more broadly is to realize that platforms aren't necessarily special creatures. We sometimes have to treat them in law in a special way, but not because of who they are, but just because of what their role is in the information ecosystem. Because at any given point in time, any individual is either a creator of content or a facilitator of content. And you don't have to be a big company or an individual to be one or the others. We're always potentially both. Did you forward that email from somebody? Congratulations, Section 230 protects you. Did you know that? It's true. Um, so you're being a platform, but you're also being an individual speaker. If you, you wrote the original email, you're creating the content. If you forwarded the email, you're a platform. Same thing when we have platforms. They are facilitating an awful lot of speech. And then, and I know this was coming up on Twitter when, oh, well, what about the amplifications issues? Well, when they're making the editorial decisions about what speech to promote, they're, they've got their own First Amendment interests that end up getting caught up in this. Um, which doesn't negate the Section 230 protection, let's not get in the weeds. But basically, one of the things to look past is that not to look at it where we're not in a world where it's just Twitter and Facebook and Google, the GAFA companies. Um, we're in a world where all 7 billion of us play both roles. And as we think about what regulatory structure should operate here, we need to keep that in mind and not accidentally entrench it so we've only got GAFA and nothing else. So right now, largely, we still have the companies deciding their own content moderation policies. They're, you know, at the steering wheel, 
for the foreseeable future, particularly in the U.S. So um, could, could we just uh, go through everybody, you know, what is one way you think, if you were advising the companies on their policies, their content moderation policies, how could they do a better job of drawing out the positives in conversation and, you know, diminishing some of the more negative and harmful kinds of speech online? So um, I've been advocating uh, for a while now that the uh, platforms adopt and abide by the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. It's the global corporate responsibility standard for all um, types of, of business entities, but it's applicable to platforms as well. And that basically means that they should align their speech codes with the international standards for freedom of expression, originally, you know, negotiated by Eleanor Roosevelt. So there was a big American role in, in these um, standards. And essentially, this will protect all of us, because right now we may have people leading the standards, uh, excuse me, the platforms who want to protect speech but are pushed into not protecting speech. You could be in a world one day where the platforms don't want to be protecting speech for a variety of reasons, right? Um, so you want them to uh, abide by a principled basis. And that, that international standard, it exists. And essentially, it says speech rules cannot be vague. Why would we want any powerful entity, whether state or platform, ruling us under vague rules? And it also says any restriction must be the least intrusive means, right? If there are other means available, a restriction on speech is not valid. Again, we would not want either a state actor or a platform ruling us on the basis of uh, restricting us when it's not necessary. Um, so I think it's very important to get the companies to agree to this. And it also gives us uh, an important paradigm for looking at what countries around the world are doing. We shouldn't just say, oh, people around the world have different views on speech. There is an international standard. All those countries should be held to that standard. And that's how we can look at Singapore's fake news law. And that's how we can look at Germany's Nets DG law. We're not looking at it through a First Amendment um, lens that they don't accept. We're looking at it through the international standard. So I really encourage everyone to consider that as a way of bringing a framework for all these discussions. Um, I think um, one of the things companies can do a little bit more is have more um, not user generated, but user focus. Um, design matters. I think that sometimes gets um, short shrift, um, but the, how you build your tool and how people interact with it and how you see people interact with your tool and your service, um, I think you really need to speak to what your user needs are and make sure you're servicing it. Um, one of the things I think we see with tech lash is just people being resentful because they can't you know, the, there's some network effects and people want to be part of these communities and they're very, very frustrated with these communities and these tools and these services that aren't necessarily being responsive to them. Try not to do that. It just antagonizes your users and then they run to Congress, et cetera, and the regulators and it just turns into a whole mess. Be responsive from the outset. So there are a lot of things. Um, I would say that uh, um, my first advice is recognize that whatever policy you put in, somebody will figure out a way to hack it um, and abuse it. Uh, and whether that's for commercial abuse purposes, uh, we see on YouTube now the latest thing is for copyright uh, um, you know, for people to make copyright claims uh, in order to hijack and monetize other people's uh, videos when they have no right to it. Um, because it turns out the system that Google set up makes that very easy to do, uh, to make that kind of a claim and then put the burden on the content producer in order to show that the copyright claim was false. As opposed to a takedown, it's just where I claim, yeah, I want the monetization aspect. Uh, we see this on Facebook all the time with people uh, who are uh, uh, reporting various forms of abuse that are not forms of abuse. We see uh, efforts to short circuit uh, um, time sensitive speech. Uh, so uh, there has to be some kind of clear, transparent, remedial process uh, that recognizes that uh, people are going to abuse the system and that their people need remedies to protect themselves. Uh, so I mentioned before that uh, we rolled out those principles for continued U.S. tech leadership. Um, everyone in the room who works for a company should read them and then make all of your business decisions based off of them. Um, <laughs> but no, I'll, I'll try to leave you on a, a, a slightly heterodox point. 
Um, there's a lot of energy and effort put into trying to make sure that if one platform makes a decision that they think is right for their community, that everyone else adopt those rules, or that we turn to some centralized authority and force the tech companies to make those decisions. There is real value in having different platforms that have different rules for different circumstances. And so it is a good thing that Vimeo and YouTube have different policies for what types of video they allow users to host. It is a good thing where Twitter and Facebook and YouTube have different policies for different types of speech on their platform. And rather than trying to urge uh, homogeneity, which tends to be a race to the bottom in terms of free expression, we ought to encourage dynamism and experimentation and trying new things between companies and be comforted when they make changes along the way. Okay, so that's all the time we have. Sorry we ran over a little bit to everyone in the corner, but thank you all so much. I bet we could talk forever, and I feel like we probably will about this topic. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>